Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Praise God. I want to share something with you. It's a pre-sermon to the sermon. I learned something recently. In Exodus 13, God said to bring the firstborn of your son, your sons and your lambs, your livestock, bring them and give them to me. Now the lambs would be sacrificed for the boys. Okay, they didn't do human sacrificing in Israel. Okay, so the lambs would redeem the boys. So they would bring the lamb forward and they would sacrifice it unto God as a symbol of representation of the first fruit of what God has given them. But when they had a donkey, the donkey was considered unclean, it was unedible. So every time there was a donkey that was born, the firstborn, they couldn't bring that to God. So what they did was they brought a lamb in its place. That's biblical and for today, that the clean animals redeem the unclean animals. Guess who the unclean is? And guess who the clean is? See, Jesus was the clean sacrifice, the clean lamb that would redeem every unclean person in the world. You know what's kind of funny? Because sometimes we can be like donkeys, can't we? A little stubborn, a little stubborn. For every unclean person, there was one sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In, for, in John chapter 1, John the Baptist says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world when Jesus walked on the scene. Do you know that Jesus died to redeem every single one of you? We were born into sin. We are sinners. And Jesus gave his life. And you know what that means? God gave his best, his first fruit. And this is what it says in Romans chapter 8. I'm going to go to it. i got to read it to you. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful because God gave his first so that we could be redeemed and saved. And it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, it says, and we know that God causes, I'm sorry, that's 28. That's a good one too. You ready? And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Praise God. God gave his best, gave his first so that we could live forever. That's why we thank him. That's why we worship him. That's why we give him our everything today. And that's why he's so good. It's out of that goodness of God that we are faithful back to him and that we're good to God. It's a heart change. We've been talking about this and generosity. It's a hard thing. It's not an obligation. We want to be generous. We want to love God. We want to be thankful. And we just sang about how faithful God is and that we would give him our everything, our whole life. God, we thank you for cleaning us through your son, Jesus. You redeemed us. You bought us on that cross. You paid the penalty we could not pay. So Lord, we are amazed by that. And in gratitude, we say, thank you, I receive that. It is finished. My sin has been paid for, it's done. The debt is paid and I'm set free today. I don't have to live the way I used to live. I pray God that you would save people, whoever's listening online or in this room, that God, they would know they are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, that you came to make us clean in your sight. We thank you, Lord. Change our stubbornness into willingness in Jesus' name, in every area of our lives in every area of our lives. God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God, praise God. Mm. Amen. You may be seated. Wow. When I graduated from college, four months later, I married my beautiful bride, Rachel. And yeah. And she, <laughs> she moved out, or we moved out of our parents' house. That was good, right? Move out of my parents' house. And uh, we went to an apartment, and uh, I learned some valuable lessons on money my first year of marriage. 
Can anyone relate? And after a year of living in an apartment, I decided to buy a home. And you heard my testimony. We learned even more. But one area I did not have a piece about early on in my ministry here, early on in my marriage especially, was my giving to God and his work in this church and this community. I really didn't have a piece about it. And the reason why is because I discovered that my finances were more revolved around me rather than God. And I'm going to be really honest with you about something. Okay, I'm, I'm confessing here. I would teach the youth to keep God first, but for some reason I ignored my financial area. It was like everything can stay God first. When I wake up in the morning, pray, talk to God, you know, everything, right? Let me pray about this decision first. But when it came to my finances, for some reason God wasn't first. So today's message is about prioritizing giving and specifically prioritizing giving to God. This helps us lead to generosity. Here's the two big points for today. And man, God got a hold of me, he convicted me, but he also has given me a joy to give to him. But here's two big points. Giving to God's work and mission is a priority in scripture. It's a priority. And secondly, generous people prioritize giving. We make it a priority in our lifestyles. And ready for this, being generous is an overflow from being a giver. What God taught me was, Ryan, you have to be willing to give in order to be generous. In order to have a spirit of generosity, there has to be, at least be a spirit of giving. And Acts 20, 35 says this, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Oh, isn't it? It's so, who loves Christmas? Who loves Christmas, right? Christmas is awesome. Um, some of us, we use um, newspaper still to wrap our gifts. They don't have the gift of, of giving, just so you know. No, I'm just joking, I'm just joking. Then you have the people who go all out. They get the gold ribbon. They get the really nice paper. You know, it's like, wow, they really get into this. The gift of giving. There's joy in having it, but all of us are meant to give, whether we have the gift of giving or not. Proverbs 11, 24 through 25 says, give freely and become more wealthy. That's interesting. Be stingy and lose everything. This is the book of wisdom, by the way, in Proverbs. So this guy was really smart. <laughs> the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. When you give to God's work, when you give to others, you will be overjoyed and refreshed. Let me tell you a quick story. Um, I, when I was a youth pastor early on in my days, when God was teaching me some lessons about his provision, and he had to show me how faithful and providing he's going to be. Um, what he did was he gave me a gift and a card, and inside the card was a $75 check. And I went to go cash it, and I, and I cashed it here, right here at M&T Bank. I put it in my jacket pocket, and for five days, I couldn't find a way to spend it. Now, what I did like a knucklehead, and Dave Ramsey would be mad at me, is I kept sliding my card instead. Dave Ramsey does not like cards, just so you know. So what I did was, instead of just using the cash, I kept using my card, and that wasn't very logic for me because I, logical for me because I have cash in my pocket. Why would I just not use the cash? But God kept saying, save it, keep it in your pocket. I just kept feeling that in my heart. Anyone ever feel like that burden to keep, like to listen? When you hear God speak, it's like a burden on your chest, right? Or in your gut. So fast forward five days. I'm not going to say the name of the person because they still attend here. But someone needed a ride to a person's house who does mechanical work on cars and fixes and does oil changes and brakes. And so he said, hey, can you take me? My car's done. And it, this is Friday. And I need a ride there. We're in the car. And all of a sudden, I, God's like, release the $75. <laughs> and I'm like... Oh, it's in there. It's in my jacket. I, it was winter time, so it was a winter jacket. And sure enough, $75 was still in my pocket. On the way there, and we, we pull up to the house. We pull in the driveway. I see his car. His car is done. I pull out the $75, and I say, I feel, I feel like I'm supposed to give this to you. And they didn't want it. They took it anyway. Um. All of a sudden, I pull away, and I get a call about 30 minutes later. Hey, um, how did you know it was going to cost me $75? 
I did not know that. I was just doing, by the way, who do you use again? I'm coming here to get my brakes changed, everything changed. That's a great price, right? No, I knew who it was. But I was like, wow, that's amazing. That's God. And he said, yes, it is, because I've been very, it's been very hard financially in my home right now. That was God. That was God answering a prayer. That was God showing that person how faithful he is. And then God gave me the joy to give. God gave me the joy, experiencing the joy to give. I got hit with a question and it didn't even have to do with money at first. This had to do with everything about my life, not just money. But I got hit with a question one day from God and really from a pastor, uh, God through a pastor. And the question that I got hit with was, does God deserve my best or does he deserve my leftovers? The first fruits principle in the Bible aligns our ability to give and our, our, the priority really, I'm sorry, the priority to give. Just like God gave his son and Isaac was Abraham's first son. They dedicated their first to God. It was a priority principle. Keep God first in your life. Amen. Cain and Abel, I'm going to just tell you the story what happened. Cain and Abel, they both brought offerings to God. God actually didn't ask them to bring offerings. They willingly brought the offerings and, and that's interesting, by the way. It was a willing desire to give God an offering, okay? They both bring one. Cain's wasn't accepted, but Abel's offering was. Why? Because they both gave to God. What we found out and what there's some couple theories historically and biblically is that in some translations, it says that in a certain time, Cain brought forth his fruit but it wasn't necessarily his first fruits. Abel brought forth the firstborn and he brought the fat, the best part of that animal to be sacrificed and given to God. By the way, this was both willing to do it and God accepted Abel's gift because it was out of faith, according to Hebrews 11:4, out of a willingness and desire to give to God, he brought his best and the first produce, the first fruits of whatever he had. And that, in this case, was an animal. And then there's nothing wrong with bringing fruit. The problem is, is Cain didn't do it so much out of faith, but out of reluctance. So God accepted his offering. What does that teach us? God wants you to give, but he wants you to give willingly. He wants you to give by faith. He wants you to trust him so he can see how good he is. And man, have I seen that myself. We go further into scripture and we see that Exodus 23, and this is why, this is important. God, God likes to be first, right? He deserves to be first. Exodus 23 says, you shall have no other gods before me. Do you know what we do in America? We trust in money before we trust in God. One of, one of the best ways that you can trust God over all things, over all people, is to surrender an area of your life that is the hardest to let go of. For some of you, it may not be money. For some of you, you've already decided and already started giving to God above and beyond. But for some of us, there may be another area. It could be the trust of your kid's salvation. It could be whatever it may be. God is looking for you to trust him, to trust him and to give willingly Keep him first. Don't have any other gods. Don't even let worry be a God over him. The first and greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, part of your mind, part of your strength, part of your soul. All. What does that mean? Jesus is saying everything, all that you have, give it all to me. Give your whole life to me. It's to surrender your whole life to him. If he has your whole life, That's where God hit me, man. God hit me so hard. He hit me to the core of my heart. He's like, am I first in everything, Ryan? Ah, there's one area, God, you you keep getting me in. And that was my giving. Proverbs 3, 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Again, the wisest man who lived other than Jesus, Solomon. Solomon was given a choice. He can have anything he wanted. Do you know what he asked for? Wisdom. I like his book. If you want to be wise, you should read Proverbs. And he says, honor the Lord with your wealth. 
the best part of everything you produce. Here's what happens. Giving to God first is a principle that aligns all of your finances in proper order so God doesn't get our leftovers. What I wanted to show you last week with the, the jugs here is, is we get, the, we get the, the resources from God. It was that green jug and he pours into our lives and there's some holes in our lives that need to be fixed up and patched up and Jesus does that for us. But what I didn't show you is, is before, before he, I'm gonna use my phone, before he pours into us, what we need to do is, is do our giving before it ever goes in so it can't be wasted or squandered or be leftovers. Because here's what I did. I would wait to give after I took care of all of my personal things. And remember, all, all of my finances revolved around my needs and everything that I was worried about, everything I was concerned about, all of my fa- finances revolved around that. And guess how happy I was? I wasn't happy. No matter how much I try to help myself, I can never find joy and happiness because joy is tied to generosity. (laughs) Did you know that? Joy is tied to obedience to God. Joy is tied to trust. And I needed to learn that the hard way. And God got my attention and it's been so amazing to be able to have my finances in order. And by the way, I'm not doing the, the mechanics of budgets in this series. We have uh, on, June, on January 23rd, we have the uh, Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University. The Collins will be teaching that. They're here today. They'll be teaching that group. Get, in, get involved. If you need help to get out of debt, if you need help to be more generous, this is a great group to go, go through. Amazing people, amazing people getting out of debt getting their finances back in order. It's a powerful group. I want to encourage you. That's January 23rd. So I'm not getting into the mechanics, but what I found was, here's what happened. Two things happened when I put God first on my giving. God is honored and doesn't get my leftovers. And the things that you would normally want to spend money on all of a sudden didn't fulfill you. Isn't that interesting? It's like, man, those shoes are nice. But you look at your bank account and you go, all right, I did 10% for giving, 10% for saving. I paid for my bills. Oh, I don't have enough money for those shoes. I guess I'll live with the other seven pairs. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm like convicting anyone right now, but no, I'm not. I mean, I just got to be real. It's just, this is me. I didn't need the, the 13th cup of coffee that week. My heart didn't need it either. Neither did my stomach because I was getting the nice, nice tasty ones. You know what I'm saying? The ones with extra sugar. Hey, this might change your health, right? Because you don't spend your money on things that are harmful for you. Isn't this interesting now? Get your finances in order. Give to God first and watch him bless you. Watch him take care of everything else. Watch your desires for the things of this world grow strangely dim. Okay, the power is still on. Yes. For those of you who weren't here last Sunday at the 11 o'clock, as soon as I said those words, the power went out. Wow. So this is what I discovered. When we give to God first, the desire for other things fade and suddenly they are too expensive. Not giving. Ah, man, I don't have enough to give. That's, That's a lot of money to give. No, I flipped it. When I obeyed God, all of a sudden it was, there was the coffees and the clothes and the extra stuff I didn't need were too expensive. The cars were too expensive. You see what I'm saying? And then God saves you from the debt because now you're a slave to debt because you gave in to buying things you shouldn't have bought in the first place because it should have belonged to God first. God knows what he's doing, church. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to order your finances. <laughs> Praise God. I get excited because I've experienced this firsthand. I've seen it in my own life, and I am just thanking God so much for his provision. So how much do we give? Well, one of the things we do in churches, one of the things my family decided to do was to give 10% to God right away. To get, before it goes in, boom, 10%. Now, you don't have to make that law where you have to do it at the beginning of the month, the first day, all that, you know, it's okay. Some of us pull it out throughout the month or pull it out in the middle of the month. You know when you get paid. But one of the things my family did is we said, we're gonna commit 
and be generous to God. And that was our baseline. Tithing was our baseline for giving to God. Anyone have, this is going to be a little hard maybe because there's less people in here. But does anyone have $100 cash to be willing to, to bring up to me real quick? $100. Believe it or not, we had someone do it the first service. Oh, thank you. Come on up. Yes. No, you hang out with me, okay? Hang out right here. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. You broke it up for me a little bit. Okay. You just willingly trusted me and gave me $100 cash. Security, make sure we keep an eye on her on the way out. No, I'm just joking. We got, no one's going to rob you. We're good. You got a tall, strong husband. You're right. Brownie points for you for saying that. You just gave me willingly $100. You just, you just entrusted this $100 to me. Now ask me for 10% back. Can you get $10? Uh, no. Now how messed up is that, that I wouldn't give her back $10 of her own money? Do you think that's wrong? She gave it to me. God's giving you the breath to get up today. God's giving you the energy to work today. If you have to go to work later on, God has given you a home. God has given you air conditioning, heat, a car. He's given you everything you possibly need because everything belongs to him. And he takes care of his children. He takes care of his people who trust in him. And this is a trust test, isn't it? Well, here's five. Thanks for breaking that up. No, you know what? Here's my 10. Thank you. And here's the $10 back to you. I appreciate this gift. Thank you. I'll use it well. No, I'm just joking. Here you go. You can have it. You have it. God bless you. Thank you so much. Give her a hand. Thank you for bringing $100 to church. I was like, man, I hope people have $100 cash because everyone uses cards and stuff like that nowadays, you know. So thank you for doing that with me. So what is, what is the 10% principle? The 10% principle is, is God says, give 10 of the 100% I already gave you. 100% of it belongs to him. 100% of it belongs to him. He's helped you. He's gotten you to where you are. Honor him with just 10%. So that's a tithing principle that my family lives by. Genesis 14, I'm going to breeze through some of these because of time, because of my announcement. But Genesis uh, 14, we see that Abram rescued a lot from being um, killed and he was captive, held captive. He goes and rescues Lot and out of that help from God, Abram gives God 10%. Go to the next verse so you can see this line. He says, be blessed by Abram, by, most God, by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And check out this next line. And blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth. This is the priest of Salem a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. This was a willing gift, not asked of him to give. The king of Salem, Melchizedek, did not ask for 10%. He just willingly gave him 10%. So that's the model. That's the principle that people use because of that. Look at this next story. And, and this is Jacob. This is Abraham's line further on. Abraham, I'm sorry, Jacob he has this encounter with God. He has a dream, the staircase of heaven, and he's so amazed by what he sees in this dream and vision that his response out of gratitude and out of all and worship of God is to give 10% of what he has. And you can go to the last verse for me for that. Be my God and this memorial pillar I have set up will become a place for worshiping God and I will present to God a tenth of everything he gives me. And that tenth there is an ongoing active giving. So every time that Jacob was going to be blessed, he was gonna give 10% back to God. Why? Out of a willing gratitude and worship and trust of God. Because of what he encountered with God, what he saw in that vision and he saw God's faithfulness to him. I want to go to Malachi chapter 3, and I have the longer version that I'm going to read. But if you have your Bibles, you can go to Malachi. It's the last book of the Old Testament, right before Matthew in the New Testament. Malachi chapter 3. And the people of God this time were in trouble with God here a little bit because they weren't obeying and trusting him. And we get some powerful scripture here. And by the way, this is the only time in scripture where God says to test me. To test me with your tithe, test me with your finances, test me with your giving. It's the only time in scripture God says to do it. It's pretty fantastic. I've never, 
I've always just kind of been like, you know, because the Bible says don't, you know, don't test God. But God gives permission in this moment to test him. This is what he says in, in verse 6, Malachi 3. I am the Lord and I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed because his promise was still there for them. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me and I will return to you. So it was conditioned upon whether they obey. God was already there. He's there. He's waiting, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we return? We have never gone away. And then he says, should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? And then God says, you have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. See, what was happening was they were unable to perform sacrifices because the Levites weren't getting the tithe of the people. They were unable to properly worship God because the giving wasn't there. Wow. So their, their worship was hindered by the lack of their giving. Verse 10 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. I heard a pastor say that you can't give God your tithes because it never belonged to you in the first place. Bring it back, in other words. Bring back what I already gave you. That one stung when I heard that. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open, look at the promise. If you give to God today, because God never changes. Listen to this. I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant. So there'll be a blessing upon your stuff, your things, your belongings, your income. For I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe. You know what he's going to do? He's going to preserve your income. So the other, let's say you choose to do a 10% tithing principle. You choose to do that as a family. He's going to protect your other 90% and he's going to flourish. I like that. That sounds good to me because I've seen my money disappear out of nowhere. You know what I'm saying? I've seen my car break down. And by the way, God's not punishing me, but God teaches us lessons. You know what happened? I was holding back my giving to God. And so guess what started happening? My stuff started falling apart. My savings account started draining. As soon as I started taking care of God first, my saving account went back up. My giving was back up. Everything was back up. Because God preserves people who obey his word and trust him. Most of all, trust him. So giving to God is an act of worship and trust. My friend, Carrie Lynn, um, and thank you for hanging out a little longer. I realize you're wearing a mask. I know it's not easy. Thank you for being patient. Um, I want to show you this testimony. My friend, Carrie Lynn, one of our own, he's, she's on the worship team. You'll see. She, uh, she shared with me her story a couple years ago, and I just thought, man, what a powerful lesson for all of us to hear because we've been there. And I just think, man, so cool for her to be vulnerable and real about her own life. Um, it's, it's not easy to do this to tell the honest truth about your own finances. Um, So check this out. I pray you're blessed by this video. Hi, my name is Carrie Lynn. I've been coming to Calvary for a little over 29 years. I grew up in a Christian home where I saw my parents tithe regularly, even when it was difficult for them to do it. So as an adult, I knew that I should be tithing, but I didn't. And there were lots of reasons I didn't. Um, I didn't want to. I felt like I didn't make a whole lot of money. And... God would understand if I didn't. I also felt, oh, well, you know what? I I gave money to someone who needed it this week. That counts. And I would justify my disobedience. I would hear a sermon and I'd be convicted that I wasn't tithing. And I would tithe for a few weeks, but as soon as I had something else I wanted to spend my money on, I would justify not doing that. There was a sermon about a year ago, two years ago now, and I couldn't even tell you what the sermon was or what verses were said or who gave the sermon, but I know the conviction was so strong that day that I knew I needed to do something about this right away. And one of the benefits of working for the the school here at Calvary is that I have the option to have my tithes taken out automatically from my paycheck. So the very next day, I emailed our accountant and I said, "I'm, I'm struggling with this. I need you to take it before I see it. 
and it was a rough few weeks. That first paycheck, I saw how much had come out, and I was like, ooh, didn't think it would be that much. And at that point, I was really glad that it was something that would be automatic and it would hold me accountable because it wouldn't be something that I would willingly do every week, knowing myself and knowing my history. I knew I wouldn't do that willingly. And I didn't get it perfect right away. There were weeks that I didn't make wise decisions. I didn't account for the tithing coming out. And to be perfectly honest, I would overdraft my account. And that happened a couple of times. But what I have seen is God has blessed me. He's blessed me through other people. He's blessed me with opportunities to earn a little extra when I need it. Um, and money just falling into my lap that I didn't know I needed. And then I would get a bill the next day for something. Or my car would break down. Or I would need to, to make an unexpected purchase. And I've seen God's faithfulness through my tithing. It was about a year after I started tithing that I felt God calling me into ministry with the worship team. And I really feel like he was waiting and seeing if I would surrender my finances and see if I would be willing to make that financial sacrifice, knowing that there would be sacrifice and there would be challenges coming in my service with the worship team. My biggest justification of not tithing was I work for a nonprofit, I don't make as much as a lot of people, the church probably doesn't even notice my, my lack of tithing. It doesn't even hurt them. But when I look back on that, if a thousand people give just $100 a month, that's $100,000 that goes into our church's budget to serve our community, to serve our church members, and to spread God's mission. So it's a big deal. And I know that God is going to take whatever we offer and he's going to multiply it because that's just what he does. So I would encourage people, no matter how you're feeling about tithing, to give whatever it is you can because God will use it. Amen. Awesome. Praise God. <laughs> it's so cool, too, because she, she was right on the money, quote unquote, about the where it goes to the mission of God, the work of God. And she made a sacrifice and now God has turned around her finances. I know more about her story now. It's awesome. And God is just so faithful. And it's hard to experience that faithfulness if we don't step out and trust and see it. How many want to see God's faithfulness even with our finances? Right? You want to see that faithfulness. Praise God. So let me close with 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, because I found something here that's so interesting that God showed me. Remember this, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 through 8. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but so sparingly, in other words, so sparingly, reap sparingly. But the, the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. So sow generously, reap generously. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And then listen to this, you ready? And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. That's the journey of generosity. You know what God showed me this past week? Again, I didn't even see this. Remember how I was telling you my story about my home a couple weeks ago? If you haven't seen that service, you need to watch it. It's the first sermon. God has been so good and faithful. I was guilty of giving God my leftovers. What does this verse say? Then you have always everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. God flipped my leftovers. I left, I gave him my leftovers. He gives me even more. That's a good God. I wasn't worthy of that. I wasn't worthy of, of his leftovers. I wasn't worthy of more basketfuls of provision and yet he brought them to me. And I wasn't even worthy of it. That's God. That's God. Church, let God, let God be first in your life. Make God first in every area of your lives. Prioritize giving to the work of ministry. Watch him show up in ways you never expected. Amen. I'm going to pray and then Dorothy's going to come out and finish off. So we got some great news to share about this past weekend. God. You're speaking loud and clear through this message today. Your goodness, your grace, your provision is so good. 
Lord, I pray that you would work on our hearts, Lord, to trust you in every area of our lives, including our finances, God. God, we thank you for the privilege and the honor to do ministry here in Dover, Delaware, and beyond. We thank you for this church and what we're accomplishing, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your provision. You've been so faithful and you've used the obedience and the faith and the trust of your people. And they have seen your good works and faithfulness because of it. So Lord, increase our generosity, increase our obedience today, work on our hearts, and may we give willingly and cheerfully instead of out of reluctance. We thank you, Lord. We give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 